Jody, do you, you're going to let people in? You want me to do it? It doesn't. No, I'm just going to admit all. I'm not going to okay. do the whole thing where you check Sounds each good. name. But thank you. I'll keep an eye out for late attendees. Thank you. So before um, we start, I just want to tell the students how much I enjoyed this class and working with them and getting to know them. And um, I'm really, really, really proud of the work that's come out. And um, I, I haven't been this energized teaching. I mean, I, I, I'm hyper and I get energized regardless, but this class really, um, really was satisfying. So nice to hear. Can I let them in? Are you okay? Everyone, Me? thumbs up. Oh, thumbs up. All right, they're coming in. Welcome everyone to Low Connects. Just giving it a few minutes for people to join from the waiting room. Thank you for joining us. Just seeing a few more people. Welcome again, everyone. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Welcome everyone to Low Connects. We're just giving it a few more minutes for people to join from the waiting room. Feel free to say hi in the chat if you wish to. Great to see you here with us. Okay, so I think we will get started for time's sake. Thank you for being on time. So again, welcome everyone to Low Connects Art Lab at the Low 2022. Adios Cuba, hola Cubanidad the art and architecture of Cuban modernism. My name is Jody Seifer, I'm the curator of education and I am glad that you are here. Um, just a few um, housekeeping items. I think everyone knows this by now, but um, if you need the live transcript, you can, hopefully you can see it already, um, but you should be able to enable it on your end. Also, there'll be a survey at the end of this program. We appreciate you taking a few moments to fill it out as we really do read all of your um, comments and um, take into account your opinions. Um, please save the date for the next Low Connects. It's an, gonna feature another wonderful University of Miami collaboration and partnership with the University of Miami Department of Theater Arts sophomore Bachelor of Fine Arts Musical Theater students. It's called Giving Voice, Original Monologues Inspired by Visual Art. Um, that's gonna be on Wednesday, May 11th at 5.30 to accommodate the student schedules. But the, these are not the current students, these are past students who have perform original monologues inspired by works of art in the Low Art Museum and the collection. So they will be performing those um, really wonderful. We will share a link at the end for you to join that to RSVP. So getting to tonight's program, um, Art Lab is a really unique and wonderful um, collaboration and partnership. Um, during the spring semester, the Lowe partners with the University of Miami faculty member and their students to curate an exhibition as part of the annual Art Lab at the Lowe. 
the students select the scene, a theme, excuse me, for their exhibition and choose objects to research from the collections at the low, sometimes the special collections at the UM libraries, the Cuban Heritage Collection and or the University Archives or a combination. Um, this is a great hands on opportunity and teaches students how to curate and create a museum exhibition from start to finish. And this collaborative project in 2022 brings together works of art from the low, the Cuban Heritage Collection and several private collections that deal with issues of modernity, identity, tradition and the avant garde in the art and architecture of mid 20th century Cuba. The professor for 2022 Art Lab is Victor Dupi, senior lecturer at the University of Miami School of Architecture. The teaching assistant is Soren Rostami, and the student curators are Charlotte McCabe, Valeria Diaz Ruiz, Noel Maranac, Ricky Durga, Francisco Sanabria, Mallory Harrington Fay, Ale Alexandra Fleming, Zara Silva Landry and Alexis Pagano. I'd just like to um, form, more formally introduce Victor Dupi, the senior lecturer at the University of Miami School of Architecture, where he teaches architectural history and theory, design and representation. His research focuses on the early modern Spanish and Ibero-American world, mid 20th century Cuba and contemporary architecture. He has many books, as you can read here, that he has published, and he is, was also the president of Sintas Foundation dedicated to promoting Cuban art and culture from 2016 to 2018. And Soren Rosami is a second year Master of Architecture student at the University of Miami School of Architecture. His undergraduate degree is in architectural engineering. And he has strived to discover the relationship between culture, architecture, nature, environment, and time history. He uses novel approaches compatible with the realities of current society and has been trying to implement superior identity-based architectural criteria, climatic adaptability, and architectural aesthetics into the, into the form generating practices. And I'm hoping he'll explain all that to us soon. So I would love to, um, turn the tables over to Victor Dupi. Thank you. Let me share my screen. So uh, thank you, uh, Jody, and um, thank you all for joining us. I'd like to start, first of all, by uh, thanking the Low Art Museum, in particular, uh, uh, Jody and uh, Dr. Mark Osterman, who have been with us um, from uh, the beginning through the entire class. Uh, Eugenia Inser and Colby Cook also were uh, instrumental at various moments uh, in the process. And uh, I really have to thank Soren, my research. He's a research assistant and teaching assistant for his, his dedication to everything um, we've been doing. Finally, uh, and I, although I know that the director of the low, uh, Dr. Jill Dupi, would prefer that I not mention her, I think it's fair um, that on behalf of the students, uh, I'd like to thank Jill for her involvement in the program and for um, the solid real world advice that she gave the students. Uh, the topic of this year's art lab was uh, Cuban modernism um, in mid-century art and architecture. This is something that's very uh, clear, uh, dear to my heart as a Cuban American architectural historian who works on the art and architecture of uh, the island. Cuba is also one of the six pillars of the Low Art Museum, which houses uh, one of the nation's largest assemblies of Cuban and Cuban American uh, art, consisting of nearly 600 works in their permanent collection. Uh, that plus the extraordinary Cuban Heritage Collection at the University Library and a handful of other local and other, uh, other uh, collections that we used uh, made this topic uh, particularly rich. I would like to add also that this is the second art lab that deals with Cuban art. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Lillian Manzor, taught an art lab two years ago that looked at visual art and theater. And so this year we're continuing that trend with Cuban art and architecture. So the group that um, you see um, uh, listed uh, in the, um, uh, you saw listed previously consists of four uh, uh, 
uh, undergraduate, four art, College of Arts and Science students and five uh, architecture students, both undergraduate and graduate. The, um, the uh, students engaged in a semester long uh, researching, curating, and designing of a digital exhibition using three separate technologies. The one we see here is the ARC GIS story map platform uh, for digital exhibitions, uh, which is the, the university's official uh, platform for digital humanities projects such as this. Uh, yet before we uh, even started building this uh, presentation, the students were working with um, a, a separate whiteboard called a Miro board that we use often in the School of Architecture. And this is an interactive, a live digital platform where the students could work together, uh, pulling different material ideas. Uh, we had discussions on themes, on, on titles for the exhibition. We put together some literature that they shared. And we even had a preliminary plan of uh, the Lowe's temporary galleries, which then they could start populating with things and move them around. And that was a, a, a dynamic process that lasted for quite a while. From there, uh, Soren uh, produced an extraordinary 3D model of the um, Lowe's temporary galleries, uh, putting in on the walls um, the, the various works of art, the wall text, uh, the color schemes, which all of this had to be also approved by the director. I think the students found that particularly entertaining to have to deal with a, uh, a, a real, uh, real situation of no, no, <laughs> no, that was uh, extraordinary. Um, and so uh, all of that, uh, and this model was produced using some um, architectural software, uh, SketchUp, uh, Rhino, uh, and um, Adobe Illustrator. Um, and as you can see in the uh, back two rooms to the lower right, uh, the students, some of the architecture students also produced 3D models of existing and uh, unbuilt projects to give them a, a kind of life. And you'll see some of that um, in a minute. So uh, tonight's presentation, however, is an abridged version of this entire exhibition as there are simply too many works to include in one single slideshow. The final presentation will be made available in approximately a week when classes end, and the students will upload the remaining uh, pieces and images. Uh, nevertheless, I think you'll find that the results of what they've produced and the 3D visualizations are simply breathtaking. Therefore, I'd like to uh, thank the students for their thoughtful and diligent work and let them take you through their exciting journey of co-curating this exhibition. So uh, students, the floor is yours and I will simply move the mouse. Alrighty, so I guess I'll kick it off. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for showing up. My name is Ricky Durga. I'm a third year undergrad student in the College of Arts and Sciences. I'm majoring in art history and anthropology. So. Um, I thought this class would be an invaluable experience to delve deeply into a topic and get some really interesting curatorial skills along the way. Um, so yeah, the impetus for this uh, exhibition based off of um, Professor Dupi's expertise and uh, the class's interest in identity, its construction, the perseverance of identity and the transformation of identity uh, was a perfect schema to map on the history of Cuba throughout the mid 20th century. As many, if not all of you know, I mean, the 20th century, uh, in the 20th century, Cuba experienced a vast amount of change socially, culturally, politically, resulting in uh, a mass exodus of immigrants to the United States and around the world. And so clearly there was a lot of change uh, related to people's geopolitical ties, but also family structure and how that changed and how that was a dynamic model for so many people. And so we were really interested to see what the cultural and social underpinnings of those things were, uh, of that ex what that experience was and how that manifested in the art and architecture of the mid 20th century. And so that's sort of where we got this idea um, of Adios Cuba, Hola Cubanidad, because we wanted to emancipate 
our monolithic understanding of Cuba and Cubanness and the Cuban identity with the island, of course, and I'm not, I, I, none of the members of the class would, uh, are suggesting that that's not important, but rather our understanding of Cubanness is a bit more nebulous and it's not necessarily strictly associated with your place of origin or your designated citizenship. And as such, we wanted to talk about, or we wanted to track that trajectory and um, that sort of phenomenon and that experiential quality of being Cuban or the Cubanidad. So in our experiences and through our readings and our research, we came across this concept, which was really cool and how, uh, which it basically explains, uh, the literature basically explains this concept as once Cubanness is not tied to their, their expressed citizenship, but rather it's a set of cultural values and practices and their lived experiences. And that's evident and it's elucidated by our huge uh, Cuban diaspora community here in Miami. And we see how much of that culture travels with its people. Um, and so this show is just an exploration of that phenomenon from its, from its roots and uh, through the 20th century. So to open the show, uh, we really wanted to take uh, we this beautiful piece by uh, Hugo Consuerga, who was a Cuban-born artist. Uh, he was born in 1929, and he was a member of the famed group known as Los Once, uh, which was essentially a conglomerate of 11 artists who were really pushing the envelope in Cuba just pre-revolution. Uh, they are often cited as the as the trailblazers for abstract expressionism on the island, as you can see by the work here on the left, it's uh, very evocative. Uh, these artists are interested in creating works that are that turn on the emotional and evocative qualities of color, of line, of form, which is a vast departure from traditional Cuban arts up until this point. I mean, I believe prior to abstract expressionism, the most avant-garde, or I shouldn't say the most avant-garde, but uh, more po the most popular avant-garde movement in Cuba was uh, was Cube uh, was Cubism, um, and so here we see a complete departure from form, and we see or from recognizable form or from objective form, and we see a much deeper fascination with uh, the psychology of being Cuban, especially in the wake of political unrest and social and social upheaval, and so we see that. And this exists right in that center, in that center period, I believe this piece is created uh, right on the precipice of the Cuban revolution or very in close proximity. So we see that it's right in the center of Cuba's most transformative period. And we see how the artists and the arts uh, react to that. Charlotte? Um, so moving on to Carlos Enriquez, this is the Mulata. Carlos Enriquez Gomez was a brilliant Cuban painter, illustrator, and writer of the Vanguardia movement. Enriquez was involved in one of the most creative times in Cuban culture, and he is one of the most unique and best Cuban painters of his time. Um, he was inspired completely by surrealism and modernism, and he took most of his inspiration for his art from the culture, from social problems, the way of living in Cuba, um, and a lot of the landscapes as well. And he liked to blend them together to create his own unique style that had never been seen before. Um, as an artist, Enriquez was known as a rebel because he did go against the social norm, but going against the social norm also helped to shape art throughout Cuba and throughout modernism. Hi everyone, I'm Francisco Sanabria, and uh, here we have Carmen Miranda performing at the Tropicana nightclub in Havana. And so here in the image it shows her at the center stage of the open air under the star saloon. And in her dramatic wardrobe, she's surrounded by her dancers. And into the back, we have a 3D geometric metal sculpture by uh, Max Borges. And meanwhile, this photo shows us nightlife and excitement. Here, uh, Carmen Miranda was approaching 50, and at this point in time, she no longer was able to 
uh, star in films and was only in small TV shows and had to result to playing here at a nightclub. And what even gets more interesting about it is here she looks alive, she's vibrant, she's moving. She actually was dying. Um, <laughs> the hot, cute, humid air, and then the AC that was, you know, hitting her uh, at night after night uh, was basically killing her in a sense. Um, this was the last photograph of her performing uh, before she returned to Beverly Hills and passed away. Um, so it, it just, in the sense, even though she wasn't Cuban herself, uh, it shows the spirit of Cubanness. Uh, you know, you work hard, you strive, and you move forward even though things might not be so good on, you know, the inside. Hi, everyone. I'm Alexis Pagano. I'm a graduate student in the School of Architecture. And this is a beautiful um, ceramic tile done by Rene Puerto Carrero. Unfortunately, it's untitled, but um, lots to look at and take in. Uh, Rene was a largely self-taught artist and educator who created a large body of works, you know, in different mediums, not limited to like painting, but also like sculpture, book illustration, ceramics, as this piece is done in. And he was never known to really plan any of his work, thus resulting in like a high spontaneous and free style of painting, which is what this image kind of represents. It's kind of free, it's all over the place, but it's really beautiful. And this is an illustration of the Virgin of Charity with a babe in her arms. And it's set in a colorfully rich and organic ceramic tile. So looking back to what Ricky had mentioned earlier about Cubanness, this piece really draws a direct parallel to what is Cuban. Um, to give some premise to this piece, I believe it's necessary to kind of understand how and why the Virgin of Charity became Cuban's, Cuba's patron saint. Uh, one day in the fall of 1612, two indigenous brothers and an enslaved boy discovered this, you know, four inch effigy of the Virgin and they took it back, they shared it with their people and word spread, the effigy began to disappear and people thought someone was stealing it. So they built um, kind of like a little, you know, building to house this effigy in and just give her a place to rest. And um, over time, it became a place where people would visit. It's began a history of devotion and myth-making that would eventually turn this version of charity into you know, Cuba's patron saint and one of the island's most enduring cultural symbols. And today she dwells at a pilgrimage church in the Southeast rural countryside of Cuba. And she's kind of ascribed to countless miracles and more amazingly unites everyone under the belief that there's a hope that one day all Cubans, both on the island and in exile can be healed and reconciled of deep wounds that exist and maybe one day un be united as one. And most Cubans, um, believe that wherever there is a Cuban, there is the Virgin of Charity. So, Thank you, Alexis. My name is Valeria Diaz Ruiz, and I'm going to introduce the next section of the exhibition entitled Cuba Modern, A Little Drunk with Color. So in the late 1920s, the Vanguard, the Vanguardia movement began in Cuba a little later than in Europe and America. This was a very pivotal, pivotal time in Cuban art history since it was characterized by a separation between the traditional European academicism in painting and the modernist style that was to be adopted and reappropriated by the artists in the island. They shifted away from subject matters such as religious themes and instead focused on beautiful scenes of daily life in a manner which drew inspiration from Cubist and expressionist styles, but with their own Cuban twist, making them truly their own. Nearly 20 years later, in 1944, Modern Cuban Painters was exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It was curated by the famous Cuban art critic Jose Gomez Sigres and organized by Alfred H. Bart. He was initially intrigued by the vividness and uniqueness of Cuban art, but unfortunately described it as being a little drunk with color. Given that he was inclined towards um, the more well-known Mexican art and muralism of the time. This show included works by 12 Cuban artists from the Origenes group, which included Amelia Peláez and Cudo Bermúdez, whose works will be present in this section of the exhibition. More recently, in the year 2000, the late Juan Martinez curated from modern to contemporary Cuban art. 
which brought to light not only artists from the Cuban Vanguardia, but also artists from the Miami generation of the 80s. This exhibition featured works selected from a collection of more than 500 pieces that were donated to the LOAP by the Cuban Museum of Art and, Col and Culture upon its dissolution. Therefore, it is from these events that we will be drawing inspiration to curate the following section of this exhibition titled Cuba Modern, A Little Drunk with Color. We aim to introduce contrasting sides of the exterior versus the interior of painterly and defined brushstrokes and of very a very distinct wave of modernism that was unique to the island and characterized by its very own vibrant colors. In doing so, we hope to reassess Barr's condescending description of modern Cuban art in a more fav favorable and accurate light. So here we have Untitled from 1963 by Amelia Peláez. She was born in Yawahai Jaw in 1897. She studied at the San Alejandro Academy like many other artists in this exhibition, and was the student of prominent Cuban artists such as Leopoldo Romagnac. Pelaz lived in Paris for a period of six years and traveled extensively throughout Europe before the outbreak of World War II. This painting, executed five years before her death in 1968, presents a woman dressed in a long gown and seated on a wicker high back chair set against a bright red background or a carpet. In this piece, she utilizes complex black twisting lines with which the artist intended to mimic the twisted shadows created by the elaborate, elaborate weaving of rattan, as well as two panels of vibrant cost, contrasting colors which allude to her studies in color theory with fellow artist Alexandra Exter during her time in Paris in the late 1930s. Pelaez was also known as a woman of few words and was considered to be quite introverted. And it is through works such as these that we are able to know a deeper and more intimate side of the artist within the boundaries of her daily existence. This painting is therefore a beautiful combination of the artist's appropriation of the modernist and expressionist influences from Europe and her own personal experiences in Cuba. Alexandra? Hey, my name is Alexandra, graduate student in architecture. May. Um, this is a. Alex, we're losing you. Here is, um, it's a piece that. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, should I just. I'll take out my headphones. Yeah, we were losing you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yes. okay great. So this is a piece by Ana Rosa Gutierrez. Um, it's a piece dedicated to her daily life as an artist and a painter living in Havana, um, which was greatly inspired by her everyday surroundings in her painter's studio. Um, in the painting, we see her Victorian chair, which we assume was used in um, her studio while painting. And we also see the painting palette and brushes that she used. Um, these would be the instruments that she uses in her paintings, and we also see some decorative elements that represent some of the stylistic qualities of the features. Um, it's also worth noting that the presence of the typical Cuban domestic elements, like the geometric tiled floor, a stained glass window, and a still life painting with a, with a paint, within a painting um, of tropical fruit on a side table are also all present. So this, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So this untitled piece here, uh, done in 1947 by Roberto Diago, uh, is a piece that speaks to the Afro-Cuban experience. As an artist who is of Afro-Cuban uh, of Afro-Cuban descent, uh, he was interested in themes of citizenship, visibility, violence, mistreatment of the Afro-Cuban body, and of Afro-Cuban um, and mixed individuals. I don't think. It's lost on anybody that a discussion about the Caribbean uh, is a discussion that is completely void of any sort of critical race talks. Uh, clearly there is a divide. It's a nasty vestige of colonial rule that unfortunately impacts all aspects of life in the Caribbean, especially if you are somebody of mixed descent. And I think Diago recognizes that and is willing to speak on it in a way that not too many people are because it is 
an ugly history. It, it is an ugly phenomenon. Um, but and this is a this is a, a great manifestation of that. So here we have a figure who is twisted and contorted, and you're really only able to tell that it's a figure because of the two legs and the two arms. Um, but it's it seems subhuman. There's no head. It's void of any identity. The figure is being uh, punctured and sliced and contorted in a way that does that clearly speaks to some sort of violence. And if it's contextualized within his larger body of work, uh, it's understood as uh, a testament to the violence both explicit and implicitly experienced by um, black and brown peoples, not only in Cuba, but possibly in the Caribbean at large. And I think it's very important because in this discussion and in our holistic view of Cuba, especially through the mid 20th century, we have to also recognize that uh, there is an inequity in the representation of specific perspectives and Diago is a is a phenomenal testament to uh, a very an all too important experience um, and it's a uh, it, it speaks to uh, a population that has historically been overlooked in this space so uh, we thought it was crucial to include this piece especially as we discuss how race evolves throughout the mid 20th century and is still experienced by uh, people of African descent in Cuba and in Cuban dias uh, diasporic communities. So here we have Homenaje, um, created in 1952. Um, and this work was executed in the early 50s by artist René Portocarrero, which was highly recognized and praised for his unique style of painting in Cuban, of Cuban cities and nature. This time in the artist's life was marked by a transition from his popular scenes and rural la landscapes to his interest in new mediums such as ceramics and sculpture. He created this piece using ink, watercolor, and acrylic and was heavily inspired by, by his experimentation with poetry at the time, which we are able to see through the abstract lyrical fluidity with which he created the geometric figures in this work. This painting was inspired by his previous work, Homenaje a Trinidad, which had previously won the National Prize in Painting in 1951. This was also one of the first Latin American art donations given to the Lowe Museum and holds a special place in the museum's per permanent collection. My name is Noel, and I'm going to be introducing the next section on landscapes. I'm a fourth year undergraduate studying neuroscience and criminology. Um, so there has been an evolution in how landscapes have been portrayed throughout Cuba's past, and this correlates with the wide range of Cuban experiences. Throughout the early 20th century, there was a demand for increased labor and ultimately a coming together of peoples from different backgrounds, which created the diversity that still exists on the island today. The people during this time shaped a rural countryside, which some artists chose to highlight in their work. Um, other artists chose to portray Cuban values and culture through a pristine and idyllic presentation of landscape or in an abstract manner so that people are drawn into the beauty of the island and can form an interpretation based on elements of their own past. So this piece titled Palmar by Juan Gil Garcia, was, who was born in Spain, and he eventually moved to Cuba. In his paintings, he emphasized the Cuban landscape and also made a lot of works depicting native fruits and flowers in a luxurious manner. And he was one of the first painters to do that. He became very popular on the island due to his glorification of the Cuban landscape, which was especially attractive to the Cuban middle classes. This oil painting specifically features the beauty of the island through palm trees, flowers, and the light blue sky. In the background, you can also make out a small village alluding to the ability to live in such close proximity to or within such a picturesque environment. During the struggle for independence in the 19th century, landscape art became more prominent in general because the overall sense of nationalism at the time, coupled with the increasing amount of natural environmental phenomena like hurricanes and cyclones made Cubans more attached to their environment. 
On a deeper level, the water is naturally reflective and is depicted in this way in the painting, which could possibly be reminiscent of the idea that landscapes can act as mirrors, meaning they can reflect the features and values of a culture, so in this case, Cuban culture. Antonio Mourinho Socho has a diverse artistic background, and this is shown in his work, in his untitled work. Not only has he been involved in art in the sense of drawings and paintings, but he also obtained a degree in plastic arts and journalism from his studies in Havana. Um, so in this particular work, he depicts the harsh reality of the Cuban landscape, particularly by depicting the rural countryside. You can see barrels, farm buildings, and a horse, and the absence of the actual workers makes you focus on the somewhat worn down scenery that can be associated with such hard labor. This labor was prominent, especially during the seasonal sugar production for which the industry expanded in the 19, early 1900s. The increasing demand for sugar due to general population growth and investments in Cuba's economy, particularly by the US, um, subsequently led to an increased demand for labor. And a significant amount of help can be attributed to the Haitians and Jamaicans brought in by the Cuban government. And there was also an overall increase in black immigration during this time. Additionally, pre-revolutionary Cuba saw some inequalities specifically between the city and countryside, as well as between white and black Cubans. Yet these inequalities allude to the wide range of Cuban experiences, distinctly in the struggle for freedom and in navigating cultural comprehension. And artists such as Soto sought to reveal some of these Cuban experiences that had not yet been brought to light by some of the other Cuban artists of the time. Um, so in this section, Urban Myths and Realities explores the reemergence of Cuban culture in American art through paintings and photographs by artists with a renowned appreciation of architecture and vivacity. Cuba's culture is redefined, understood, and illuminated. In response to Fidel Castro's reign of Cuba, artists have begun a Cuban cultural renaissance through their work, shown here in the Urban Myths and Realities section. Through their works, these artists uncover the myths and realities of urban Cuba, shedding light on the mysterious island and its capital, Havana. This photo is called Tourists in Trinidad, Las Filas, Cuba. And Tourists in Trinidad is a black and white photograph that exquisitely captures the distinct moment in time and space. This vertically oriented image shows well-dressed visitors making their way down a narrow cobbled lane in the colonial city of Trinidad on the southern coast of Cuba. The contrast between the rustic vernacular city and the rural, the rural countryside with the dense vegetation and mountains in the distance. This shows fashionable figures in the foreground and it captures the many phases of Cuban life at the time. Through these people, you wonder where they're walking to. Hi, um, my name is Zara Silva Landry. I'm a master's student in the School of Architecture here. Um, the two photographs that I'm gonna be talking about by Hazel Hankin were shot in Old Havana in 2010. We were lucky enough to come across Hazel Hankin's photographs early on in the semester, and she was an amazing resource throughout our art lab experience um, for those of us that were inspired by her photographs. The first photograph juxtaposes eclectic, classical, and colorful Spanish Catalan architecture while capturing four individuals, people watching under their protected arcades. The next photograph captures six boys climbing on temporary scaffolding left outside during the restoration of a historic building. These two shots encapsulate how the city of Havana was built to last for centuries and render how the Havanese people occupied street and architecture. These works reflect our room's title, Urban Myths and Realities, because of how these photographs uncover urban life on the island through a lens that not many people see. So this is a Maria Martinez Cañas work. 
to gelatin silver print, creating these negatives based on Cuban maps. The spike-like elements are made to represent the barbed wire walls and spikes to represent the feeling of separation and encasement. Um, the nude pictures are being used to contrast that effect by showing vulnerability. Um, she uses actual archive maps and historical documents to further ground her art in history and using the images to ground them in emotion. Hi, so um, this is a room called Place in Memory. Um, this room is all about understanding and addressing the dichotomy between interiority and exteriority as both an architectural concept and a built condition. Um, lots of ideas about Cuba are displayed here through colors and textures that are found on Cuban land. Um, we also take a moment to view and understand the modernity of Cuban design in the built environment through built and reconstructed architectural work. Um, so the main intention of this room is to bring some intimacy to the idea of what existence might look and feel like in a Cuban setting. Um, and it becomes intimate in the way that it's tangible and allows the viewer to feel a little bit more personally connected. Hi again. Uh, so as a third year uh, School of Architecture student, I got really excited when uh, Havana Hilton came up on our list. Um, Havana Hilton was the Latin American tallest and largest hotel when it opened in Cuba's capital in 1958. And eight months later, Fidel Castro and his revolutionaries marched in and took this unapologetic, unapologetic icon of capitalism to begin their socialist rule. Um, the tower itself was 416 feet. Uh, it was uh, designed and built by Welton Beckett. Uh, Welton Beckett is the uh, man responsible for the Beverly Hills Hotel and Arroyo and Menendez also were a part of this building. Uh, we got this photo from their archives. Um, so this iconic uh, building itself is a good represent, is a representation of capitalism and how Havana itself was a global city and you know this was a place where people went before the, the fall of its uh, social structure and stuff um, but in itself it's an amazing example of how the integration of modern art and human art are integrated uh, at the bottom here we have uh, a painting well, mosaic by Amelia Pelias here we have uh, one of the original renders of it and the lobby. <clears throat> Howard Ben Trey's 1980s proposal for a pavilion on Arambudu Street mixes unique seating arrangements, vegetation, textures, and his iconic glass sculptures as elements to revitalize this historic street in central Havana. Howard Bentre was an American artist that is internationally recognized for his unique sculptures, which were primarily made out of cast glass, as well as other large scale works of art for public and private spaces. These renderings were done by the Rhode Island based company AMD, and it helps visualize the public interactions with the pavilion better than the previously made lucite cardboard and foam models done by Bentre before he passed. Um, this this project was given to me later on in the semester. So Soren, our graduate assistant, helped um, me create a digital 3D model of the pavilion and how it's supposed to be situated in relation to the heights of the streets or the buildings that um, are along the Arambudu Street. Hi again. Um, so this is a these next uh, four images are just a series belonging to the collection of Vivian des Economicas created by Artaud and his partner Gutierrez during the 1950s. So the first two images are built examples, while the third image is just a plan and perspective drawing of one house that has um, been conceptually modeled by myself using a 3D software and um, 
Affordable housing began to emerge as a, a concern in the pre-revolutionary Cuba and the overall production of you know, public housing was little to none and pretty insufficient to the ever increasing demand. Um, Carlos Artaud became one of the earliest advocates of Viviendas Economicas, which is um, architecture designed affordable homes. And the homes that were designed by these two either took the form of improved vernacular dwellings for those that lived in the countryside or similarly to this picture, you know, um, a simple modern home that responded appropriately to the urban working and middle classes. And normally these homes were, you know, stylishly modern and simple in plan, and they often occupied pretty straightforward rectangular lots. They were typically one to two stories with a single sloped roof, projecting eaves, stone walls in the front, and, you know, louvered systems to allow for the entry or, you know, blocking off of light during certain times of the day. And um, yeah, this just shows an intimate Cuban home and how the physical conditions and experiences come together to create a very distinct feeling of Cubanness. And Vivian, this economic has became a staple in a world where affordable housing was insufficient and allowed for families to have the comfort of an actual home. Okay, so um, this piece is by Juan Robert Diago, who was previously mentioned. Um, as you can see here, Robert Diago has handcrafted 26 houses made from wood and other recovered materials that were found in Havana, Cuba. So these came directly from the surroundings and from the environment. Um, when viewing this sculptural piece, it's obvious that these were recycled or discarded objects, um, most of them being wood, cardboard, and fabric. Um, and one could assume that this might be a metaphor for the way that some parts of Havana have been renovated and revitalized, um, while other parts haven't. Grandson of the previously mentioned, Diago. Oh, right. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so this is uh, Humberto Casado who was born in Cuba and moved at a very young age to Miami. Um, his work combines the colonial and neoclassical architectural styles from Cuba and the greater Caribbean with the surrealist influences in order to focus on the feelings associated with each building in the architectural scene. Uh, as Calzada continues to create new pieces today, he hopes to restore Cuba through his paintings. With modern and colonial buildings alike in ruin, he attempts to restore his home country with acrylics and color, recreating his memories of the past through Cuban motifs, a tool in which to connect his modern art to the past and root it in the rich culture of his ancestry. So I'm going to just share a few comments on this last room. Um, as uh, my research assistant Soren is, is very, very shy and would prefer that I speak. Uh, in this back room, we have a series of architectural models and drawings of built and unbuilt works. It's an ongoing project that um, Soren and I have been working on with another colleague at the School of Architecture, Professor Jean-Francois Lejeune. And we're exploring, creating new drawings, new analyses of Cuban modern architecture of built works and unbuilt works, uh, which we are going to create another new ArcGIS story map uh, about that. Uh, but we felt that they uh, belonged here, um, including projects such as at this back wall, the Mies van der Rohe proposal for the Bacardi headquarters in uh, Santiago de Cuba, which was never built, and then a series of houses, um, uh, modern houses uh, throughout the island. So that brings uh, our abridged uh, presentation to a close. I'm, I know that um, we have a few minutes remaining for questions, and I'm sure that many of you would like to uh, probe the students on some of their thoughts. I would like to thank them all for being so um, thoughtful and, and uh, also very concise. We are on time. I was always afraid that we might not be. So hats off to you all for the hard work. Um, I think the digital renderings look absolutely stunning and I don't know how on earth these can be uh, duplicated going forward. Jody, should we pass it on to you? How would you like to 
manage to should I should I close out of this? Um sure you can leave, I'll leave Unless it open. You want to leave it up? Yes, thank you so much. Um Victor and Soren and all of the student curators. This is and to Mark Osterman, who I know helped um tremendously and was in the class almost the whole time. Um, it looks really beautiful and um, if anyone has questions, I think some of them were answered already and some people were asking, it would be great if maybe you could sort of explain, I think um, it maybe it wasn't clear to some people that this what you've been showing is not just a PowerPoint, but the actual virtual exhibition. Can you talk about that a little bit and how um, I know you did in the beginning, but maybe some people were there. Sure, sure. Um, so we use several platforms. Um, ArcGIS uh, Story Map is the official University of Miami Libraries um, digital humanities uh, template. So any faculty throughout the university who wants to do a digital humanities project can, sorry about that, can use um, this, uh, this platform to create presentations, research projects, you name it, uh, work with students. So we felt um, that uh, we could we should use um, uh, that. And uh, at the same time, we can accommodate, um, we can import architectural models and drawings that the students create using typical AutoCAD or Rhino. Rhino is a software that allows you to work in plan, elevation and three-dimensional perspective or axonometric. Uh, SketchUp is another um, um, template you can use or software you can use to build architectural models. Uh, and so the students, the, some of the architecture students uh, worked with uh, these models. Uh, some of the art history students worked on sort of crafting the, the various themes of the exhibition. And um, Eventually, we can have that uh, 3D model. I'll take you all the way back to the beginning. This 3D model can be moved, rotated. You can move, you can take it, walk, walk through it. And for the final exhibition, we'll probably explore more views, create more, more of these. But this is a kind of, um, uh, and, and this was something that I believe uh, Soren produced last summer when he was an intern at the Lowe, uh, so that the Lowe can have this um, uh, model for future use. And it's, it's as you can see, you can get uh, really beautiful um, renderings of uh, the spaces that make you feel like you're inside them with the works of art uh, located um, at eye level as they they should be. So really it's, it's, it's a, high technology applied to um, uh, a student research experience that is really rare um, in, yeah, in this day and age, I think. Great, thank you. So again, um, Mark has posted in the chat the link to this presentation. It's on the Lowe's website. And as um, Victor has just said they're going to be making some more changes to it. So this is just an abridged version, um, but everything that you've seen tonight is there right now. Um, a lot of congratulations in the chats um, from people, um, but you sort of answered one of my other questions a little bit in that um, the students were not all architecture or art history or even art majors. Um, so it seems like a really daunting task to sort of take Cuban art and architecture and try to narrow it down into these themes. I wonder if maybe um, one of the students or you or everyone wants to say something about um, how it was to select just a few works of art and come up with the title and um, working with that daunting task and what you came up with and how you arrived at it. Students? I think it was a very collaborative effort in regards to everything, especially since we're all, you know, studying different things and we have different experiences and background. I think all of our different perspectives kind of contributed to our ability to create something that could be appealing to everybody and 
something that everybody would want to understand as well. Thank you. Anyone For sure. Else? Um, <clears throat> if I could speak on it a little more uh, to what Noel was saying, I think it was a really valuable experience to come from all of these backgrounds and all of these artistic interests and historical interests and architectural interests and um, try and coordinate all of those moving parts. And I like that uh, Professor Doopy put up the Miro board because most of our classes were just us sitting in front of this board working through ideas. And I mean, from week to week, things were changing so drastically. Uh, somebody would find a new piece or somebody would introduce a new concept or we'd uh, be introduced to a new piece of uh, literature that would completely change the way we were thinking about things. And so I, that idea of really being receptive to everyone's like interests and uh, whatever we could come across or whatever we can find was I think a really cool experience and at first it was super daunting in addition to having to do everything else but like not just just not knowing how the logistics of curating a show goes um, but I think it was pretty cool that we kind of could all do it together and kind of experience those awkward growing pains a little together and we got to I think in the end it came together um, in a really cogent way. Thank you so much. Anyone, any other student curators want to comment? Um, I'm an architecture student and I've never worked on something like this before. So I thought it was amazing to kind of bring um, even art and modernism into everything. Um, also to the class, I've never worked with a group like this before. We were all able to collaborate so well and Professor Dupi did a really good job of making that happen. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everyone. And yeah. I'm very proud of all of us. <laughs> um, if I may add, um, as a Puerto Rican, I think this was a really uh, good way for me to learn more about Cuba and really dive into what made Cuba such an international place before the fall of it. Um, and now I can take these lessons and teach others what, exactly, you know, what made this, the country so vibrant. Thank you. I would add just one, one thing that we didn't mention is that no sooner had the Lowe Art Museum opened in, um, was it 1951 or 50, fall of 51 or 52? 52. 52. Uh, 52. Uh, in the fall of 1952, this exhibit that you see on the lower right, Seven Cuban Painters, that was organized also by Juan uh, Gomez Sicre, that I believe it opened in Boston. It moved to Washington, D.C., to the Museum of the, um, of the, um, um, of the Americas, uh, and then uh, came to uh, the low. Uh, it was the very first exhibition of Cuban art uh, in Miami. So uh, the students wanted to really sort of build upon that tradition of, of exhibitions of Cuban work um, here, uh, as well as uh, at the MoMA that um, triggered that, um, that theme of a little drunk with color. And I thought that, um, it's, it's a rich story worth telling that is, it, it is a Miami story in many ways. So hats off to the students for taking it on. Yeah. There, was a, there, was a, there was a question earlier about how architecture deals with uh, social issues. And I mean, I think we, we um, discussed some of it, uh, for instance, housing. Um, housing is one of the biggest um, issues uh, both pre-revolutionary and post-revolutionary, and producing high-quality, affordable homes for people uh, in the city and elsewhere um, was uh, a central uh, theme of Cuban modernism. And even as early as the 1930s, there were uh, discussions on how to transform the vernacular rustic huts in the countryside by giving them better sanitation, running water, um, bathrooms, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that has always been one of the, you know, quality of life issues is how architecture often uh, deals with, with social issues. Thank you. Yeah, there was another question about um, um, what, I don't know if you know the answer to this, when did closets begin to be included in the houses? That's a largely a post-war uh, phenomenon, uh, you know. Um, and if you go, if you go to Cuba today, it's really wonderful because 
Um, sometimes if you go into people's houses, you'll see that they have these extraordinary wooden armoires from the 19th century. I mean, enormous, the size of like my bookcase behind me. And that's how people stored clothing in wooden furniture, in armoires. Um, and it's really a, largely a product of, of post-war growth and expansion, um, you know, with, with modern kitchens, modern baths, closets, more stuff. Thank you. And yes, I, um, Nathan Timpano, Dr. Timpano wanted to know if the murals were still, the mosaic murals were still on the Hilton um, buildings, but he Googled it and said, yes, they were. <laughs> so um, it, it comes and goes. I mean, I think, I, I believe that there's even been a recent renovation, restoration of it. Um, I should note, and I'm going to go back to that picture because uh, the picture that you see This is, I can some, I can't always figure this out. The, um, the image we had, I don't understand why it's not letting me get there. Um, okay, now we're good. Okay. Uh, that was the original mural that was put up in 1958. And around sometime, I believe in around 1971, it was starting to fall. And a young teenage girl was killed when a piece of the mural fell um, and she lost her life. So they took it down and then they replaced it with uh, the mural that we see today, uh, the Cuban fruits, which is not the exact same thing, but it's based on a sketch that they found in the Amelia Pelaez archives in her house. And they put that up and again, it's um, in bad shape and falling and chipping. Uh, and um, I believe that there, there's been even a more recent renovation of it, uh, but it's an ongoing problem. Wow, that's really- Rosa, Rosa Lowinger, I believe, um, um, no, it's not painted. It is mural, it's still falling, it's still chipping. Sorry, Nathan, it is, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's still falling. Um, uh, Rosa Lowinger has been doing, um, has written about this, I, I believe. Interesting. Thank you. So this, much. by the way, is the only image that I know of that shows the original. This is the only one that I've, I mean, maybe there are people that have photographs of it, but in terms of an archived historic image, this is, the, and it's at the CHC in the Arroyo and Menendez papers. It's the only image I've ever traced. It's priceless. Yeah, it's really wonderful to see the mixture of paintings and photographs and history and architectural models in a sort of one digital virtual exploration of Cuban modernism. It's really wonderful. So if you don't mind, you could still ask some questions. If you don't mind, stop sharing for one second. I just want to share the survey link. Thank you so much. And I want to give um, a shout out again to, to Victor and Soren and all the curators, as well as to our sponsors and to Stella Holmes. And if you, um, if you would take a few moments to fill out the survey about the program tonight, we really appreciate it. Um, you can use the QR code with your phone or you can use the link um, there, which I will put into the chat as well. And I want to congratulate everyone one more time. What a great job. I've seen quite a few art labs in my time. And this one is truly beautiful. Yeah, if anyone has any further questions. Or comments. I'm seeing a lot of great presentations. Congrats to everyone. Thank you. Very interesting. I hope you take a minute to look at the chat. In the meantime, I just want to again thank the students for their work and 
even though we still um, have one class left, left and there's still more to upload, I think that um, the final product, which will live uh, in perpetuity on the low website, will be uh, something that um, I think all of us can be proud to have contributed to. Yes, and it's really great that it, the virtual exhibitions can have a life, a much longer life than a physical exhibition. People will find it if they search online and also this um, program presentation will be recorded and on the Lowe's YouTube channel so you can visit it again and hear more about the work that was done. So thanks everyone for joining us. I hope you have a good rest of your evening or wherever you are in the world, the rest of your day. <laughs> thanks again.